Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast of the Monarch Joint Venture National Conservation Training Center Monarch Conservation Webinar Series. My name is Tracy McLeese, and I'm a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service at the National Conservation Training Center. We're glad you could join us today for our March installment of the series. So now I'd like to introduce you to Cora Lund Preston, the Communications Specialist at Monarch Joint Venture. She's going to tell you more about today's topic and our presenters. Cora? Thanks, Tracy, and hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Um, as Tracy mentioned, I'm Cora with the Monarch Joint Venture. I'm also joined by Shelby and Wendy in the chat box. Um, today, Carl Stenoyan and Dane Elmquist are joining us to give a talk about the fascinating topic of monarch parasitoids. So, um, Carl Stenoyan began pursuing a PhD in ecology, evolution, and behavior with the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota in 2012, and he's defending his dissertation this summer. Carl uses butterflies and their parasitoids to study how animal behavior and defense plant chemistry influence insect diet. He is a graduate of Gustavus Adolphus College, where he majored in biology, minored in neuroscience, and competed in track and field. Carl's passionate about many things, including teaching and mentoring undergrads, advocating for long-term environmental sustainability, and outdoor adventures. Dane Elmquist currently works for the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Washington State. Prior to moving out west seeking adventure, Dane worked in the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota as an undergrad researcher before graduating in 2014. After graduation, Dane continued in the Monarch Lab as the assistant program coordinator. During his time at the Monarch Lab, Dane was involved in aspects of the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, education, outreach, and conservation. Dane has a passion for entomology and enjoys working with educators to cultivate students' interest in insects and the outdoors. If you have any questions during today's presentation, Shelby, Wendy, and I will be monitoring the chat box, and we encourage you to put your questions in there throughout the webinar. We will save your questions and have an answer period at the end of the webinar with Carl and Dane, where we will get to as many questions as we can with the time we have. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carl to get started. Thanks, Cora, and thank you to everybody out there listening. Um, we're excited to share what we think is a pretty fun and interesting topic. Uh, just as a quick outline of the talk, I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to introduce you to monarch chemical defenses and monarchs as prey, and give you a brief introduction of parasitoids, because I know a lot of people aren't that familiar with parasitoid life history strategies. Then Dane is going to talk to you about tachinid flies and new knowledge that we've gained through the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And finally, I'll wrap up by telling you about some of my dissertation research, which addresses monarch's interactions with a little-known parasitoid wasp. So monarch butterflies are well known for at least two things. One is their extraordinary migration, and the other is their chemical defense. Monarch butterflies are toxic or at least distasteful to potential predators because they steal cardinalides from their milkweed host plants and put them into their own tissues. Cardinalides bind to essential cellular machinery of most animals and in a lot of mammals would cause heart failure if ingested in high enough doses. This uh, famous series of photos of a blue jay learning not to eat monarchs was taken by Lincoln Brower in some of his pioneering experiments to understand monarch defense chemistry. Monarch eggs, larvae, and pupae are also chemically defended by cardinalides, uh, which they derive from their milkweed host plants. Different Asclepias, or milkweed species, have different types and concentrations of cardinalides, and these differences are reflected in the chemistry of the monarchs as well. This figure, from a paper uh, by Steve Malcolm in 1994, shows that monarchs that feed on more toxic plants become more toxic themselves. And the curve in the graph shows that monarchs are very good at sequestering, even from relatively less toxic plants. I've highlighted a few well-known species for your reference. We know that monarch cardinalides have a general defensive function, yet some animals are able to feed on monarchs. There are two bird species in the Mexican overwintering grounds that feed on monarchs in large numbers, the black-backed oriole and the black-headed grosbeak. The oriole preferentially eats the fat bodies, while the grosbeak uh, 
feeds on just the abdomen and prefers the less toxic males over the female butterflies. Another predator um, that was recently noticed comes from uh, Connie Masari in California. This winter, she noticed a fox squirrel uh, that was eating the abdomens of monarch butterflies and leaving the wings uh, on the ground. Uh, it's still not clear if there's only one offending squirrel or if multiple have learned uh, how to eat monarch butterflies. Other anecdotal observations of predators of immature monarchs include soldier bugs, paper wasps, assassin bugs, garden spiders, and praying mantises. And monarchs are also host to detrimental protozoan parasite, commonly known as OE. And last but not least, monarchs are attacked by parasitoids. Dane will tell you about these tachinid flies in a few minutes, and I'll describe what is known about Pteromalus gasotis after that. Before that, however, I want to take a moment to introduce you to parasitoids, which lie somewhere on the continuum between, between predators and parasites. Predators are typically larger than their prey, prey items. They consume entire organisms, and they're always lethal. Parasites, on the other hand, are typically smaller than the host that they feed on. Uh, they often live on that host, and by definition, they do not directly kill their host, although secondary um, things can, cause, can kill the host. Parasitoids are something in between. They're similar to parasites in many ways, but like predators, they kill the organism that they feed on. Parasitoids are insects that feed on other insects, usually placing their eggs on or inside of that host. Their offspring then consume the host, eventually killing it. These parasitoids then complete development, become adults, and fly off to find a host for their offspring. There are several groups of insects that have parasitoids, but most paras parasitoids are wasps, followed by the flies. This is a caterpillar that looks like it has a bunch of Q-tips poking out of its body, but in actuality it was attacked by a parasitoid that has laid many eggs into it. You know that most insects have a life cycle that goes from egg to larva to pupa to adult, and each stage looks very different from the last. Parasitoids have these life stages as well. The wasp eggs hatched into larvae, fed on the inside of the host, and when they had their fill, they burrowed out and spun their cocoons, where they'll complete development and soon they'll emerge as adults. If this life cycle sounds out of this world, uh, the makers of these movies thought so too. That's right, the aliens in these movies were modeled after parasitoids that live right here on Earth. However, an important difference is that the parasitoids we have on Earth only attack insects and other arthropods, not humans. In fact, parasitoid wasps, unlike the wasps most people are familiar with, can't sting humans. The wasps that sting are mostly social wasps that sting in self-defense or in defense of their colony and have different type of stingers than parasitoids. Insect parasitoids attack eggs. Um, others must burrow through the bark of a tree to get the, uh, the wood boring larva several centimeters below the surface of the tree. Other parasitoids attack adult honeybees, uh, and in this case, these bees remain alive for several days after the attack and begin to exhibit strange behaviors as the larvae feed from the inside. Uh, as such, these bees that are infected but still alive have been termed zombies, which is quite a clever pun, I think. Other parasitoids. Oh, and this is uh, one of those, uh, those flies burrowing out of the bee. Other parasitoids are masters of behavioral manipulation. In this case, these cocoons on the stem have already fed upon and emerged from this caterpillar. The thrashing caterpillar remains alive, but the parasitoids have altered its behavior so that it will stay near these cocoons, thrashing at any potential predators of the parasitoid pupae until it starves to death. There are also parasitoids of aphids. Um, in some cases, these aphids can even reproduce after being stung, um, but still the, the parasitoid inside will be fatal. Once an aphid has stung, 
uh, or once an aphid has been stung, it will become what's called a mummy. It will become brown and papery, and eventually the wasp will emerge from the hole uh, on the backside of that aphid. So far we have talked about aliens, zombies, slaves under mind control, and mummies, which I think is safe to assume is a unique combination of nouns for a monarch joint venture webinar. Believe it or not, there are even parasitoids that specialize on those parasitoids of aphids. This small black wasp is a hyperparasitoid of a parasitoid that's already attacked this aphid and has become a mummy. So I've shown you that there is incredible life history diversity among the parasitoids. There's also uh, extreme species diversity. Just for comparison's sake, there are, in one superfamily of parasitoid wasps, there are about 80,000 species. In all the vertebrates combined, there are only 64,000 species. So share that with your friends and family. Uh, parasitoids are also really important for their ecological services. They are the top source of mortality for herbivorous insects which may help us explain why the world is green when we look out the window and not just a bunch of defoliated plants overrun by herbivores. They're often important to protecting crops, releases biological control agents, especially from aphids, um, moth and butterfly caterpillars, and beetle larvae. So now that I've introduced you to monarchs with food and the wild world of parasitoids, I'm going to turn it over to Dane. All right, thank you, Carl. Um, my name is Dane Elmquist. Um, as Cora said in the introduction, I used to work at the Monarch Lab um, as the assistant program coordinator, and I was involved with a lot of the work um, uh, with the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, or MLMP for short. <clears throat> so Carl just discussed chemical defenses in monarch butterflies and the parasitoids that subvert these chemical defenses. Um, I'm here to tell you some more about the parasitism of monarch butterflies by tachinid flies. Uh, tachinids are one of the most well-studied monarch parasitoids out there. Much of what we know about the relationship between tachinids and monarchs um, has been discovered with the help of the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project and the citizen scientists that contribute to the MLMP. Today we'll discuss some recent discoveries resulting from the work of researchers and the citizen scientists that have contributed uh, such data that we were able to use. Um, so the Monarch Lab recently conducted a large-scale analysis of tachinid fly data um, with the help of some experts uh, in the field of tachinidae. Um, so we were lucky enough to work with Dr. John Steyerman and Juan Manuela, Manuel Perilla Lopez from Wright State University. Um, like I mentioned, they are the tachinid experts. Um, so a lot of the work that we did um, would uh, not have been possible without their help. So we're very grateful for their contributions. Um, Elsa Gibhard right here. Um, she's a long-time MLMP volunteer and contributed uh, a lot of the fly specimens that we used in this analysis. Um, and Dr. Karen Oberhauser, Laura Lukens, and myself made contributions from the Monarch Lab. So the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, uh, I'm just going to describe a little bit about that so you guys get a sense of uh, kind of how some of this data was collected and how um, important volunteers were to this entire uh, process. So the MLMP was created out of a need for large-scale spatial and temporal data on breeding monarchs, um, and this was not obtainable by one or even a few researchers, um, so this led to the use of citizen science. Since its inception, the MLMP has gone on to recruit thousands of volunteer citizen scientists to collect data on monarch butterflies, and there are over 1,200 registered sites in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So the goal of the MLMP is to collect data that documents spatial and temporal differences in monarch abundance, which essentially means where and how many monarchs there are at different times during the season. So as you might have gotten a deal from Carl's talk, tachinid flies and other parasitoids contribute to monarch population dynamics. So it's very important that we understand the impact these parasitoids have on the general mo monarch population, um, especially currently how they might affect or contribute to current monarch conservation goals. Um, so results and data generated from the MLMP has driven monarch tachinid research efforts. And uh, much of what we've discovered about the relationship between monarchs and tachinid flies uh, would not be possible without the MLMP's wide volunteer base. Um, in fact, six uh, citizen scientists from 16 different states uh, contributed specimens to the recent tachinid analysis conducted by the Monarch Lab um, and collaborators at Wright State University. 
So the MLMP has a variety of approaches to monarch research, um, and one of these approaches involves volunteers rearing wild-caught monarch butterflies. Um, so these dedicated uh, monarch rearers um, collect larvae from the wild and uh, rear them to adulthood. And uh, a lot of the um, rearing uh, outcomes are su uh, submitted to the MLMP database. Um, and that has revealed uh, a lot about um, how Tachinidae um, interact with mon the monarch population. Um, basically, we've discovered that Tachinidae are a, a primary parasitoid of monarch butterflies. Um, they are very efficient parasitoids and evolved a, a successful parasitic way of life. Um, <laughs> success is almost an understatement, as experts estimate that there are actually um, 10,000 described species of Tachinidae um, and that's actually kind of a little low-balling it. They think the actual number may be between uh, 15 and 20,000 um, species, making the Tachinid family um, one of the most speciose families of flies out there. So they have a very successful life strategy. Um, so Tachinids are a major environmental factor um, that influence monarch population dynamics, and this has uh, prompted researchers to study them. Um, Tachinids affect the survival rates of immature monarchs, and additionally, the seasonal monarch populations in certain localities may be intertwined with Tachinid populations. Um, as we discussed earlier, citizen scientists play a huge role in making this research and data analysis possible, um, and we expect that there will be a, a summary publication um, that includes this work in 2017. This would actually be the fourth published research project that used MLMP rearing studies to document tachinid fly parasitism rates in the wild. So let's talk briefly um, about the tachinid life cycle. So you got uh, an idea of the parasitoid life from Carl's previous presentation, um, but there are some pretty unique qualities um, that tachinids exhibit. So I'll just touch on those a little bit right here. So. This first picture is of a, an adult tachinid fly. Most tachinids are larger than your average house fly and noticeably more bristly, as you can see right here. Um, I've actually read about them uh, affectionately referred to as the bristle butt family. Um, so across the family, there's a large variety of shapes, colors, sizes, and types of bristling. And uh, we'll see another picture later on here that'll uh, show that a little better. Um, tachinids have a global distribution. Um, they're most diverse in the tropics, and part of the reason for their success at inhabiting a variety of habitats across the globe is their parasitoid life strategy. Female tachinids possess many strategies for parasitizing an unsuspecting caterpillar peacefully munching away on its milkweed. Sometimes females will seek out a caterpillar host and lay her eggs on the host. Um, sometimes they'll actually inject eggs inside the host. And even um, sometimes females will search for specific habitats, like a, a plant species, um, in hopes of finding a host there. So they've got some pretty amazing strategies for actually parasitizing their hosts. Um, they have equally amazing strategies for actually seeking out these hosts. Um, as we discussed above, they have a variety of oviposition or egg-laying strategies. Um, and some hosts even pick up on olfactory cues uh, called volatiles, which are given off um, by plants that a host caterpillar is feeding upon. So they're actually sensing cues from the plants to find their host. Pretty cool. Um, other tachinids search out a host's food source or even the burrow of a hidden host and conveniently lay their eggs there. Some hosts are, uh, uh, excuse me, some tachinids are even able to recognize host pheromones, um, which hosts would use to, host caterpillars use pheromones to communicate with each other. Um, and these tachinids are able to recognize those pheromones of those hosts and actually use that as a host finding ability. Um, so they can be pretty nefarious in the ways that they seek out their hosts. Um, as you can probably tell, there are a ton of different strategies used by tachinid flies. So once the uh, egg um, or the larvae is inside the host, they um, you know, undergo that parasitoid lifestyle, eating the host from the inside out before they eventually um, need to leave their host and pupate. Usually they leave the host and pupate on the ground or uh, in the soil. Um, some species of tachinidae, as you can see in this picture, actually will eject themselves from the host, um, and they come out on these long strings that you might be able to see here that are called gelatinous tendrils. They'll fall to the ground. Um, here's an example of some tachinids that have just emerged from this um, monarch chrysalis here, so they fall to the ground and then they'll pupate safely in the soil and the whole process will begin again. 
So monarch caterpillars uh, happen to be one of the most popular tachinid hosts, um, and the MLMP uses one of its five activities to study the effect of tachinid parasitoids on monarch populations. Um, so MLMP volunteers participating in activity number three, uh, called Monarch Survival, um, and you can access this on the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project website uh, if you're interested after this. Um, so MLMP volunteers participating in Activity 3 collect wild-caught larvae from milkweed patches um, and rear those monarchs to adulthood um, in their home. Um, sometimes those monarchs don't reach adulthood, so we always ask the volunteers to record the outcome of the monarch that they reared. Sometimes you'll get that beautiful adult monarch butterfly, um, however, you might end up with this picture. Um, and you see that's a, a likely a fifth instar monarch with some tachinidae that emerged from it. Um, so volunteers record monarch survival and, uh, or whatever the outcome they may see, like these uh, tachinids that you see here. A lot of times people will be a little bummed out when uh, they've gone through the whole process of rearing that monarch caterpillar, sometimes from an egg, um, and then they never get to see that nice uh, orange butterfly, but rather they get to see these kind of nasty looking larvae here. Um, however, tachinid researchers and uh, people at the MLMP here get kind of excited because it gives us a unique opportunity to examine um, some cool ecological relationships. I'm just gonna skip over this slide here. So we make it easy for our volunteers to enter their uh, data online in the uh, um, MLMP Parasitism Data Entry database. Um, so it's really easy. The MLMP needs a, a variety of information from the volunteers um, regarding the monarchs that they have collected from the wild. We like the date that the monarch was collected. Um, very important is the instar at collection. Um, and eventually, after that monarch has been reared, you're going to want to record the result, that outcome, um, and even the number of adult flies that have emerged from the monarch. So we have a online. There's a very easy way to do this. It's about three steps. You can see right here entering everything into these fields, and it goes into an online database um, that allows researchers to analyze this data like we've done in this uh, study here. So in 2011, the MLMP actually started collecting parasitoid samples for identification. So um, we encouraged volunteers that reared monarchs and ended up with parasitoids to actually send us those adult paras uh, parasitoids, usually to kinid flies, um, and even some of their pupae and the actual um, Caterpillar, but we're really interested in the adult flies. So many people got involved um, in this project, and eventually we ended up with too many tachinids. The Monarch Lab freezer was overflowing, um, and eventually we decided that it was time to categorize and catalog these flies, um, identify them, ideally down to the species level, um, and what actually resulted out of this were some pretty cool discoveries. So in order to do this, we needed the help of some tachinid experts. Um, we were lucky enough to collaborate with the Steyrman Lab at Wright State University. Dr. Steyrman specializes in the tachinid family, um, and his lab studies the evolution and ecology of insects with a focus on the phylogeny and evolution of the tachinids, speciation, coevolution between plants, insects, and parasitoids, as well as diversity, community college ecology and tritrophic interactions. Um, so we were very lucky to have them on board to uh, help us complete um, some of the goals that we wanted out of our collection. And so here you can really see a great example of the diversity in the tachinid family right here. Um, some of the colors, the shapes, and even the bristles. So there's some great pictures. Um, and if you want more, I'd suggest uh, a, a Google search. You can come up with some really neat stuff. So. I was lucky enough to be the one to actually visit Wright State University in March 2016, where we set out to identify the species of every specimen in our collection. Um, and it was an ambitious goal, but we were able to accomplish it. Um, the major objective of the trip was to evaluate the diversity of the collection, identify the flies, um, but we also wanted to create a, uh, a characteristic matrix um, and later on an identification protocol that would allow the MLMP uh, to continue identifying tachinid specimens so this important project um, could carry on. You can see here that this is a little uh, rough draft of what eventually became the character characteristic matrix which evolved into the um, actual guidebook. Um, and actually in 2016 and 2017, Laura Lukens, um, who's currently in charge of the project, successfully used the manual to identify a number of flies from monarchs submitted, to the uh, submitted by volunteers. 
Um, the characteristics that actually separate these flies can be really hard to distinguish, and they often require the use of a microscope and uh, a trained expert like Laura, who knows what to look for. Um, to illustrate this, here's a close-up of uh, one of the tachinid fly species in our collection. And I just want to show you how fine the characteristics that MLMP staff have to look for to identify these flies. Um, so here you can see on a part of this fly called the facial ridge that it's heavily bristled. You can really get a close-up look at these bristles on the tachinidae. And that's actually an identifying characteristic to uh, distinguish between species. As you can see on this uh, tachinid fly, which is actually a different species, there is no bristles on the facial ridge. So obviously it requires a microscope, a keen eye, um, and uh, some training to know what you're looking for. Um, just as another example of how uh, sometimes involved and difficult it can be to identify these flies, um, sometimes species are distinguished by measuring the bristle size on a certain portion of the fly compared to the bristle size on another portion of the fly. So we're definitely grateful to have the uh, Steyrman Lab's help in creating this Tekinid ID manual, um, and we're fortunate that it was uh, able to identify flies even after we, were, um, after we had moved on with the project here. So with the information that we were able to gather from our large-scale analysis of uh, the tachinid fly specimens from monarchs that we'd received over the years, um, we've, we made some pretty interesting uh, discoveries. So this study cataloged and described a community of tachinids that attacked monarchs in the eastern United States, um, examined their relative frequency, their overposition strategies, and the use of different monarch larval host stages um, during parasitoid development. The majority of the analyses focused on the outcomes of rearing reported by citizen scientists to the MLMP data portal you just saw, and um, the identity of the parasitoid specimens received from volunteers. Um, these volunteers put in quite the effort, too. From 1999 to 2016, over 20,000 monarch butterflies were collected and reared and reported to the MLMP parasitoid portal. Using this data, the uh, study revealed that overall tachinid parasitism across all monarch life stages was 9.8% by tachinid flies. Um, additionally, out of our specimen collection, 1,146 flies were identified to the species level. Flies came from 16 states, ranging from California to Maine, but they were mostly concentrated right in the middle um, of the country in the upper Midwest. Um, out of 463 different monarch hosts, we found seven different species of tachinid flies that attack monarch butterflies, including one possibly undescribed species, which I'll discuss um, in just a few slides here. So we can see from this figure here um, that the frequency of uh, parasitism increased as larval instar increased. Um, which essentially tells us that monarchs are more vulnerable to tachinid parasitism as they develop. And you can see here at the fifth instar level is the uh, maximum parasitism rate of about 17%. Tachinids often emerge from their caterpillar hosts before they can pupate, uh, making the monarchs that survive to pupation less likely to be parasitized, as you can see here in this figure. So the four most common tachinid species we examined showed a lot of variation in which host stages they appeared to attack. And we're looking at the first four bars here on this, uh, this graph. Um, for example, you can see that one common species, um, probably the most common species in monarch, Lispasia archipivora, um, is underrepresented compared to the total number of monarchs collected as eggs. You see that there's no real black bar here. Um, and this is because they deposit their egg directly into the host. Um, the same pattern emerges when you look over here at Compsolera consonata, um, because again, they deposit the egg directly into the host. However, Hyphantrophaga virilis and uh, Alessinalchia species, two other tachinids that were identified from our collection, show a substantial parasitism from eggs. This is likely due to the reason they, they lay microtype eggs um, which are thousands of small eggs that they would scatter across a, a potential host habitat, um, which would then be ingested by the monarch caterpillar. Um, what this indicates uh, likely is that the instars um, that were being reared by volunteers were actually fed milkweed infected with microtype eggs, um, which is probably why we're seeing these 
um, representations here. Um, overall, you can also see that the conclusion that larval instars are parasitized um, more often as a fifth instar holds true right here um, with our most representative species in our collection, the Lispasia archipivora. So the uh, calculated parasitism rate of 17% um, for monarchs collected as fifth instars is similar to previously calculated rates um, using Tachinid uh, data. 75% um, of the parasitism in our collection was due to the most common parasitoid of Tachinids, uh, excuse me, of monarchs called uh, Lespasia archipivora, and it was actually found out of 13 out of 16 states that submitted flies. So the next two specimens that were responsible for about 25% of uh, parasitism in our collection were Hyphantrophaga virilis and Compsolera consonata. Um, we'll come back to Compsolera consonata in a little bit to discuss the uh, particular ecological significance of this species. Uh, other described species were Nylea erecta, uh, Madramaya sandersii, and uh, a Lespasia species. Um, but based on our sample size, they were a uh, very small representation of the actual tachinids in our collection. Um, so we think that they might be incidental monarch parasitoids, um, but again, we would need more data to uh, really confirm that. Um, another very interesting discovery that resulted out of this was the uh, discovery of a Leschenalcha species, which is a, a genus of uh, tachinidae. And um, when we looked at this Leschenalcha species, it actually has not been reported to uh, parasitized monarchs, and it actually looks like it may be an undescribed species um, as it has failed to match or key to any recognized North American Leschenaltra species. This is an exciting discovery um, that MLMP hopes to follow up on, and it's very possible that citizen scientists may have contributed to the discovery of a new species. So one interesting thing that this uh, study reports is the possibility of that the Lespasia archipivora that is highly represented in our, our monarch Tachinid parasitoid collection um, is potentially a monophagous species, which means that it only eats one kind of host. Um, this is interesting because archipivora are typically thought to be generalists, um, but preliminary morphological examination of uh, the archipivora from our collection by the Steyrman lab suggests that specimens reared from monarchs may actually be different from other archipivora specimens reared from different Lepidoptera. Um, interestingly enough, the, as you can see in this figure here, the year-to-year -year variation in parasitism frequency of archipivora and monarchs suggests that the archipivora actually track the monarch population densities with a one-year lag time. Further work is needed to determine um, if this Lespasia archipivora in our collection, reared from monarchs, represents a specialized or cryptic tachinid species, but it's an exciting uh, discovery with a future track for research nonetheless. Um, so just to touch on the uh, ecological importance of the Compsolera consonata. So that tachinid has a very broad host range and is recorded to parasitize over 180 species. And we actually um, had a relatively high frequency of this parasitoid reared from monarchs. Um, and this is actually notable and alarming. Um, it's because most of us know the uh, monarch population is in a bit of a struggle right now. Um, so the high frequency of this parasitoid from monarchs um, is something that it, it is good to be aware of. Um, and in, in addition to actually learning about the relationship between the uh, Compsolera and the monarch butterfly, we, uh, our records were actually able to um, expand the known range of the Compsolera consonata. Um, and we've got records in Texas and Iowa that uh, formerly were not known. Um, so again, I just really want to uh, acknowledge the citizen scientists that contributed um, to this project and made this researcher this research and answering these questions possible. Um, the volunteer ability to collect data over broad areas and times um, allows us to document new monarch parasitoids and it um, may have even contributed to the discovery of a new species. Um, the value of engaging citizen scientists in natural history research seems endless, and uh, we're very grateful for their contributions. Um, to this research. So now I'll turn it over to Carl, who's going to tell you about another monarch parasitoid um, that we are currently learning more about. All right, I'm back. Thanks, Dean. Uh, so this last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about Teramalis casotis. Uh, this is sort of a, a rediscovered parasitoid, and I'll tell you more about that story. 
I'm going to show you a couple of videos. If you're interested in uh, playing them again or showing someone else, here's a YouTube link to my channel. If you want to get in touch with me, you can email me here or, or tweet at me. So this is a, a male and a female specimen of Terramalis casotis um, that I took in the lab. And I'll tell you more about them in a second, but first we're going to watch these videos. This is a video I took in the lab. This is a female Terramalis casotis encountering a very newly formed monarch chrysalis. She's uh, investigating it using her antennae to, to chemosense, and eventually will decide that this is a good place to put her offspring. Uh, these parasitoids likely find uh, these hosts as pupae, but maybe also as Larvae. They'll find the larvae based on frass cues um, or plant cues, and they'll ride that larva until it pupates. So, at that point, there's really not much that a monarch pupa can do to defend itself. Um, but if you check out the rest of that video, you'll see the the larva is able to knock the wasp away from it. About 15 days later, those wasp uh, offspring will have developed, completed development, and will begin to emerge as adult wasps. So we can check that video out now. And one uh, female wasp can produce a brood size of over 100. I in my lab studies, the mean is about 70 offspring. But I've seen pupae from the field with over 400 dead wasp larvae inside. And what probably happened in that, in that situation was that multiple females oviposited into the same host and overexploited it. These wasps often have female bias sex ratios, and they can control the sex ratio by uh, laying either fertilized or unfertilized eggs. The unfertilized eggs become males, so they're parthogenetic in a sense. And they'll mate with their siblings immediately upon emerging, uh, and the females will fly off to find a host of their own. The males are much smaller, uh, much less robust, and have a much shorter lifespan than the females. But the females uh, survive in the lab very easily over three weeks. So for some historical perspective on this project, our lab in 2008 uh, decided that we wanted to better understand the causes of monarch mortality. In order to figure out what might be killing pupae, they put pupae outside for a few days, came back to see how many had survived, and, and tried to figure out what had killed the others. Uh, most survived these tests, but several were taken or eaten, likely by paper wasps and ants, maybe some birds and mammals. And after returning to the lab, instead of be closing as an adult butterfly, one of the 340 pupae that were placed that year produced over 100 tiny wasps instead. Our lab didn't know what species they were, so they sent them to the Smithsonian Institution. And the folks at the Smithsonian were also not confident about the identification, but they told us it looked like Terramalis puparum, which is a parasitoid known to attack several other species of butterfly pupae. When I heard about this, I thought that this was very strange because generalists typically can't reproduce in chemically defended hosts. Usually it's only specialists that attack chemically defended hosts. Uh, because these generalists haven't evolved the cellular machinery to detoxify or avoid the toxins. They just don't have that much um, of an evolutionary history with the toxic species. So to make a long story short, I collected some Terramalis puparum, the generalist, that the folks at the Smithsonian suggested, um, our wasp might be, and exposed monarchs to them in the lab. Many of these wasps eagerly oviposited into the monarchs, but none of them were able to produce offspring. 
is at this point that we realized that P. puparum was probably not the species attacking monarchs. After some biological sleuthing, I found this paper from 1888 in which the author describes a monarch pupa, which he had found and reared, only to find parasitoids emerge um, instead of a butterfly. This search was made more difficult because the names of both the host and the parasitoid had changed um, in the over 125 years since publication. And I'm this is still the only paper I'm aware of that mentions parasitism of monarchs by this parasitoid. So why is it that no one had published on um, this species interaction between 1888 and 2008? I think it's probably because finding monarch pupae in the field is hard. If you spent much time um, looking for monarch larvae in the field, uh, you can be pretty sure that you'll find them on milkweed plants, but the pupae uh, could be anywhere. The larvae wander away from their host plants when they finish feeding and may be high up in a tree or on a fence or um, in the understory, and they're quite cryptic. They blend in. Furthermore, once a pupa is discovered, it must be collected and monitored, and the collector must resist the urge to freeze the pupa or throw it out if it turns brown and, becomes, and it becomes clear that a butterfly will not emerge, which is what happens when parasitized by these wasps. So that's why we've, maybe one reason why we don't know much about this species interaction. And so probably the most basic place to start uh, in, in studying these organisms is to ask when and where are monarchs parasitized by Terramalis casotis. So far, we just know that um, in 1888, there was one record, and in 2008, it, there was one record from Wisconsin. So I've set to work collecting data, um, searching through museum records, uh, as well as working with citizen scientists. And all the states that are shaded gray on this map are known to, um, to be the home for at least one specimen of Terramalis casotis collected. Now many of these are museum specimens that do not have host records, um, so we don't necessarily know that they reproduced in monarchs. Those states with stars. Uh, we do know that they came from monarchs. And you can see that they're covering much of the um, eastern U.S., uh, but part of what's limiting this is sampling effort. Um, you can't find the wasps in places that you're not looking or that citizen scientists aren't looking. So. Since 2008, we've continued this same experiment where we place the pupae out into the field. We leave them for a week uh, in these wooden and mesh cages. Mesh is small enough to, to keep out things like polistes wasps or other potential predators, but it's large enough to let these tiny parasitoid wasps in. And so um, after seven days, we bring these cages back inside, separate the pupae, and monitor them to see if butterflies or wasps emerge. As you can see, parasitism from year to year is highly variable, reaching 60% of the pupae we placed in 2010. The sample sizes are on the bottom. Um, in 2013 and 2014, we had zero parasitism. And this was actually pretty frustrating for me, someone who's trying to study this species interaction and finding no parasitism. Um, zero is our data, but they're, they're not terribly informative data sometimes. And the last two years, we've had parasitism rates about uh, hovering right on underneath 10% or so. Of course, this is a very uh, limited scope in telling us anything about monarch population biology or parasitoid population biology. Uh, and we really need more data from other places and continue long-term studies um, in order to determine if there are population-level consequences uh, and potential conservation implications for the monarch. Another question that I was really interested in that I introduced um, at the beginning of this webinar is, that, is the question of monarch's chemical defenses and how they might influence the survival of the host or the performance of the parasitoid wasp. So in order to address this question, I reared caterpillars in the greenhouse on 
two different species of milkweed. One is very high in cardinalide concentrations and the other quite low. Um, we then had these caterpillars pupate inside of these deli containers, which you can see um, on the right side of the screen. And we exposed each pupa to one female wasp. We let that wasp hang out in the container with the pupa for two to three days. And during that time, we'd uh, make observations to see if it was laying eggs. These are the two plants we used. Asclepius incarnata is a lower toxicity milkweed down here. So presumably, the, the pupae become less toxic. And we contrasted it with Asclepius curasavica, a higher toxic milkweed. So there's a lot of information on this slide, so I'll walk you through it slowly. On the x-axis, we have the host plant. So these bars represent hosts that were reared on the low toxicity milkweed. And these bars represent hosts that were reared on the high toxicity milkweed. And then the colors represent the outcome of those trials. So green bars are where wasps emerged. Um, blue bars are where we found wasps dead inside of the host. Orange bars are where represent hosts that died, but we couldn't um, necessarily say why. We couldn't find parasitoids inside. And black bars are situations where the butterfly successfully emerged. I've mentioned uh, Terramalis casotis is the, the one that uh, is attacking monarchs. Terramalis cuparum is the one that I mentioned that uh, is unsuccessful at attacking monarchs. And using a Fisher exact test, or just similar to a chi-square test, if you're familiar with that, um, I found that the proportions of um, the outcomes of the trials were different when facing Terramalis casotis but not different when facing Terramalis puparum. The Terramalis puparum will oviposit into these hosts um, and can kill the host, but they can't reproduce in them. So it's really a lose-lose situation for the wasp and the butterfly. Um, and in Terramalis custodis, the trend is as we'd expect, but, but um, pretty weak, really. There is a higher proportion of wasps emerging when facing uh, lower toxicity hosts, and more butterflies emerging when facing when they are fed on higher toxicity plants. To investigate this one step further, I mentioned that we take observations during the trials. Um, it seems like what's happening is those wasps facing the lower toxicity hosts are simply more likely to attack those hosts than the wasps facing the high toxicity hosts. Again, there's no difference uh, with the puparum wasps but there is a difference with the Casotis wasps, and it seems like this is what's driving the differences in fate. If we look only at those hosts, uh, where the wasp, only at those trials where the wasp attempted to lay eggs into the host, um, and we plot, in this case, the number of wasps emerged on the y-axis, there's slightly higher average brood size uh, with a 95% confidence interval indicated here than uh, Asclepius curasavica, the high toxicity plant. But this is not a significant difference. Similarly, if we look at the number or the proportion of wasps that survive to adulthood, this is also not significant. And finally, I just couldn't believe that there was almost no effect of host plant. And so I decided to look at the, the lifespan of these wasps. I kept some around and didn't feed them any food or water. And, the ones reared on the low toxicity plant survived almost exactly the same length as those reared on the high toxicity plant. So it seems like the difference we're seeing um, in the fates of the wasps is really driven by the behavior, the acceptance of these wasps. And we'll, um, I'm interested to dig deeper into my data and see if I can understand why. So just to wrap up, um, I've shown you that our knowledge of monarch pupil parasitoids is limited, probably because detection is so difficult. Um, and we were doing all we can to, to learn from this rediscovery of this parasitoid. Um, I've shown you when, or I've shown you where in the United States we've seen parasitism it's across much of the eastern U.S., but of course this is limited by sampling effort. 
And parasitism in the field is highly variable, as I've shown you from our field experiments in Minnesota. Uh, but it could have implications for monarch conservation. And finally, the cardinalides derived from milkweed that the monarchs sequester seem to have little, perf little effect on the performance of these parasitoid wasps, but may, may be the factor that's preventing these generalist wasps, Teramalus cuparum, from developing in the monarch. So I want to thank my uh, collaborators in the monarch lab and uh, my department, as well as at other institutions. Again, if you want to um, get in touch with me or check out those YouTube videos, the links are down here. All right. Thank you, Carl and Dean. Um, we are going to switch over to the question and answer period now. Thank you to everyone who's been entering in your questions. Um, we will get to everything that we have time for. Um, before we quick dive in there, I just want to um, do a couple housekeeping items here. We did record today's webinar, so if you want to share it with your friends or come back and watch it again, um, it will be available on the Monarch Joint Venture and NCTC websites as soon as it is um, available. And we will follow up after today's webinar with a short survey for you to complete sharing any feedback you have about this presentation or about the webinar series overall. And we would really love to hear from you on that, so please take our survey. Um, finally, we just might not get to all of the questions that were asked throughout the webinar, um, but we'll get to as many pos as possible. So let me pull up my list here, and then we'll get started with um, some questions for Dane about the tachinid flies. Um, Dane, once a tachinid lays its egg, do we know how long before the egg hatches and starts eating the caterpillar? Uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a great question. So it kind of will depend on the type of egg that's laid. So if the, uh, you know, sometimes the egg will be laid directly onto the um, the caterpillar, and sometimes they'll hatch almost immediately and burrow into the um, the caterpillar and begin feeding. Um, other other times, the eggs are injected into the caterpillar, um, and and sometimes they will um, take a little bit of time to hatch. But the typical tachinid lifestyle, or excuse me, um, life cycle, kind of follows along with the host that they are inhabiting. Um, so it definitely varies quite a bit um, throughout species and depending on the egg type that they um, actually lay. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a similar question, we'll keep going with that theme. Um, do, do you have recordings of multiple flies laying eggs in the same larva? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, and actually um, I didn't have time to touch on that today, but multiparasitism um, is what you're describing there, and that's actually a pretty common um, in tachinids, and so they can actually lay multiple eggs inside a host, and sometimes even two s different species can lay multiple eggs inside a host. Um, and we actually did see that in our collection. Um, so tachinids that parasitized monarchs, we had, I believe it was seven cases of multi-parasitism. Um, so we had two different species emerging from one monarch host. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Carl, does that happen with the wasps as well? Um, I've seen uh, parasitoids, the parasitoid wasps attempting to lay eggs into pupae infected with tachinids. Wow. Uh, and they're completely unsuccessful. The tachinids emerge just a, a day later or so. Uh, so they were too late and not perceptive enough to know that. Um, in terms of multiparasitism with wasps, um, we don't know of any other parasitoid wasps that could cope, could. Um, do multiparasitism in monarchs, but I've seen Teramalus casotis multiparasitized with Teramalus puparum in uh, cabbage white butterflies. So it's possible with these guys as well. Interesting. Um, I, we have a few, another kind of tachinid biology question. Um, Dean, do the adult tachinids eat anything? And if so, what do they eat? Um, yeah, so the adult tachinids, they will feed. Um, during their life, um, and I, you know, I'm not exactly sure, um, and it, it will kind of depend on the species and and the habitat um, that they uh, occupy. But they, um, 
they are kind of hard to rear in the lab because of their specific dietary requirements. Um, so I've heard, never tried it. Um, so I don't have an exact answer for that, um, but their, their feeding um, definitely depends on the habitat um, that they occupy. And I'm not sure, maybe Carl might be able to um, add some input, but that would, um, yeah, again, it would depend on that, the habitat that they occupy. Okay. Carl, do you have anything to add to that or, or not? I'm also not sure exactly what to kin and feed. Uh, the the Terramouse Cassotis will feed on nectar in the field, and so in the lab I keep them alive on honey water. Yeah, and oh. that's, a, that's a common way that we do keep a lot of insects alive in the lab. So I, I'm assuming that the, uh, the Tachinidae are probably pretty similar. Interesting. Um, let me see. Let's find another question here for you. Um, Carl, are the wasps um, easily visible or found in the wild very frequently? Um, they are not. It's really the way I've had success collecting them in the wild is by putting hosts out and hoping that they get parasitized. Mm. Um, they're probably at very low densities and um, can't necessarily know where, th where they might be if they're not searching for hosts. Yeah. Um. On that train of thought, um, what do you think happened in 2013 and 14 when you were putting hosts out there um, that resulted in, in no parasitism for your study? One idea that we've suggested um, is a similar one to what Dane presented in that the density of monarchs in the previous year um, may uh, have big implications on the, the density of those parasitoids in that year that you're interested in. So uh, there were very low numbers of monarchs in 2012 and 2013, um, which may have put a damper on the parasitoid populations as well, especially if they're specialist parasitoids. Uh, they're relying on monarchs. Yeah. Um, do you know, either either of you, on tachinids or wasps, if um, environmental factors like the weather um, affect um, tachinids or wasps? Dane, do you want to go first? Yeah, you know, um, I'm not exactly um, sure on that. I think what we what we definitely do know, kind of going back to what Carl said, is that the monarch population is, is a main driver of uh, some of those parasitoid dynamics. Um, and, you know, we do know that the monarch population is at least affected by um, certain weather patterns, which would in turn have an effect on that parasitoid population. So you could kind of say, yes, um, kind of getting around to it, I would say that the weather probably would have some type of effect on parasitoid populations due to the effect it would have on their hosts. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's really fun to think about uh, what it's like to be a tiny little insect in a big world. These parasitoids are the size of a drop of water or less, so you can imagine that venturing out into a windy or rainy situation is not a risk they want to take. Um, so. Uh, nice sunny days are much more likely to be foraging, and you can see that in their activity levels in the lab, too. Um, but I can't say much more beyond that. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, Dean, so do tachinids have a useful purpose in the ecosystem other than controlling monarchs that we know about? Oh, yeah, definitely. So actually, they um, have been introduced uh, uh, for uh, benefit as a beneficial insect for pest control, um, like Carl kind of mentioned, you uh, you don't see you don't look outside and see a bunch of defoliated trees, and that's because of these uh, parasitoids. And the tachinid flies definitely play um, a large role in that. Um, actually, the Compsilura consonata species um, that's uh, kind of of concern for its high frequency of non-target hosts in monarchs um, was an introduced species um, to control the um, uh, gypsy moth, I believe, and uh, the Elispasia archipivora, um, that uh, really highly represented species in monarchs, was actually also introduced um, as a biological control species. So they have a lot of great benefits um, in pest control, um, but as we can see, some of the introduced species are also having some non-target effects. So they definitely do play a large role, um, the tachinids do, in uh, ecosystem. Interesting, yeah. Um. Dane, another question for you. Um, are there management strategies that people can use in their habitat or when they're rearing monarchs to reduce parasitism? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So, 
you know, I'm not sure if you necessarily want to reduce parasitism. I guess on a personal note that uh, to keep everything um, as natural as possible is probably what you'd want to do because, um, you know, if you do happen to get parasitism, you can report that to the MLMP, and that's really important data that we can use to assess uh, monarch parasitoid relationships. Um, but one thing that um, people that bring monarchs inside and uh, rear them, they can do, they can look for them as the uh, younger instars. So if you recall that graph showed the uh, chances of monarchs being parasitized increased linearly as the instar stage grew. Um, so those fifth instars were likely to be parasitized um, more than, say, a first instar. So if you, if you do bring in those instars at an early stage, um, they stand less of a chance of uh, being parasitized. Um, also, it's always good to wash your milkweed leaves um, very carefully. Um, again, you can kind of recall back to that um, earlier talk about those micro-type eggs being laid on the milkweed plant and then being fed um, to caterpillars, likely indoors, that are already being reared. So again, um, washing those milkweed plants uh, leaves very carefully and uh, collecting the earlier instar larvae um, would be a great way to kind of uh, hedge your bets against uh, your monarch being parasitized. Great, thank you. Um, there was also a question that I'm going to take a stab at answering here um, about how talking about toxicity, um, m you know, Carl mentioned that toxicity might make it less li likely that the um, milkweed toxicity would make it less likely that the monarchs would be parasitoid, um, parasitized, but another um, a conundrum there is that tropical milkweed has higher um, toxicity levels than a lot of other species, and um, the a different monarch parasite, OE, is more prevalent on tropical milkweed. So to address that, OE is more prevalent on tropical milkweed where the tropical milkweed grows year-round. And so that's in areas in the south and um, especially along the Gulf Coast and on the Pacific Coast. And so being very careful to choose native milkweeds um, is going to be your best bet, especially in those areas where tropical milkweed could grow year-round and foster OE, which is a different monarch parasite. Um, but there are different toxicity levels within the different native um, milkweeds. And um, Carl, do you have any thoughts on what kind of native milkweeds um, have a higher toxicity than others? Um, there are, in general, more, uh, there's more diversity of highly toxic milkweeds in the southern United States than the northern United States. We're sort of limited to just a handful of less toxic species in the northern United States. Yeah. Um, great. Well, that is all the time that we have for questions. Thank you all so much for answering so, or asking so many great questions. And I want to say a huge um, thank you to Carl and Dane for um, presenting with us today. Um, and also thanks to NCTC for hosting our webinar. Um, we hope to see everyone for our next webinar, which is going to be Solar with Monarch Habitat, a win-win in the land of milkweed and honey, uh, which will be on Thursday. April 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can visit the MJV events page to register. So just a huge thank you to everyone again today, and we will see you next time. Thank you.